So just, I think people are still joining, but I'm going to make a start because we are already on, uh, we are beyond 5.30. Darin Kruzia, Krutika, Madhuri, Shadi, Sara. Welcome uh, all of you. And uh, looks like, I don't know how many else will join, but if it's a smaller group, um, you can either communicate to me through the chat box. I will check the chat messages uh, time to time or you could also unmute yourself and talk to me. So if it's a small group, it won't be too disturbing and I think we can manage. Um, and that is precisely because I believe, you know, when, when we have a webinar, it's much more uh, fun and much more informative when we are able to discuss and uh, ask questions. There's no question like a silly question. This is a very, a, a very interesting topic, but also a topic that is shrouded in a lot of myths. So um, yes, uh, I, I have no problems if you stop me and ask in between. I think we are good to go. So Jeff, just at the very uh, onset, uh, because I think I haven't met many of you. I don't see familiar faces today. Uh, let me just introduce myself. My name is Arpita. I'm an integrated clinical hypnotherapist. Um, I work at Illuminations in the JLT Center. Uh, apart from hypnotherapy, I also practice other modalities like uh, family constellation, transpersonal regression therapy. Um, I am. I also host uh, corporate training and wellness retreats. Just to give you a very short uh, story of how I am here with you today. Uh, this wasn't my first um, career, as I say, not my first innings. I studied economics. I'm, I did my MBA and I worked in the corporate sector for close to 15 years. And then many years back, I came to this line of work, just like how uh, Kritika was sharing. Uh, I came to this line of work as a client. Uh, there were issues with my physical health that I needed to look into, which was um, medically, there was no reason behind it and there was no solution to it. And that's how I came to explore alternate healing and complementary mind sciences as a client. Um, when I came, I was not a complete believer. I was not a disbeliever uh, as well. I was somewhere in between where I was very open and I said, okay, I'm going to give it a try. And that try kind of completely changed my life. It just did not heal me. Um, it also percolated down to my children and um, my daughter suffered with the same issue that I was suffering with. And though I didn't have to bring her in for any therapy, but when I healed, uh, she also healed automatically. That's when I took a U-turn. I went back to Illuminations and I met my th then therapist and I said, okay, I want to know more about the science. I still had no inclination of being a therapist or uh, transiting from the corporate world into this line of work. But long story short, the, when I studied the course, um, which also I teach now, I'm a teacher of the same course, it completely changed my view of life. It, it changed many things in my personal space, in my professional space. And long story short, then I uh, moved from the corporate world into becoming a holistic therapist, beginning with hypnotherapy, and then of course, going deeper into it. And hence, when I do these webinars today, uh, you know, it, it gives me immense joy. Uh, because when I joined this line of work, when I came for my first session, there were so many questions in my mind about, you know, what actually happens in hypnotherapy? What is hypnotherapy? Um, what can you believe? What, what is shown on media and what, what actually happens in a session? So on and so forth. So I wish I, I had all that um, answers at that moment. Uh, I learned it through my course of finding uh, my course and, and studying. Um, but uh, that is the reason I enjoy this uh, one hour with you a lot because it brings back my memories of all these questions that even I had when I had started my journey. So what are we going to talk about today is we, of course, we're talking about the frequently asked questions about hypnotherapy, uh, the, what are the myths uh, about hypnotherapy. There are lots. Uh, I will go one by one with all of them. Um, introduction to understanding what actually is hypnotherapy and what is the domain of mind sciences. Why would you choose hypnotherapy for yourself um, as a client or to study it? And who can be a hypnotherapist? Can anybody just uh, decide to be a hypnotherapist one day? What are the prerequisites required, if at all? 
where can you study what kind of certifications do you get and basically how do you make a start now if there are more questions i will be more than happy to accommodate did that in in by the end but as i said um if in due course of the webinar there's something you want to ask please feel free to stop me and ask okay so first and foremost coming to what is hypnotherapy because there lies the um, answer and i know opens up a lot more questions now if you go by the definition of the word hypnosis or hypnotherapy we are now looking at a greek word called hypnos uh what is hypnos if you translate hypnos from greek into english the direct translation of that is nervous sleep now that is a paradox in itself right i cannot be nervous and sleeping at the same time and if i am sleeping then definitely my nervousness levels are not so high in essence what this talks about is hypnosis is a very natural state of mind it's an altered state of mind in which two things happen simultaneously one your body is so relaxed as if you are sleeping and second your mind is active when i say nervous this nervousness is not anxiety nervousness this is the alertness so a state in which our physical bodies are relaxing as if we are sleeping and at the same times our minds are extremely active is what we call as hypnotic trance it is genuinely a very very deep state of relaxation and most importantly this is a complete natural state of being everybody who goes to sleep at night and wakes up in the morning is hypnotized so today when you go to sleep at night the moments before you are actually falling asleep so imagine you switch off the light you put your book aside and now you pull your blanket you take a turn and you are about to sleep but you're not completely asleep the state between being completely awake and being asleep is called the hypnotic trance similarly when you wake up tomorrow morning you switch off your alarm you're like giving yourself a stretch or you hit the snooze button where you're awake but not awake sleepy but not sleepy again is the hypnotic trance now if you look at it from the brain waves perspective if somebody is going to be mapping your brain waves throughout the day when we are awake like right now we are awake this is called the beta state so the brain waves have a it's like a sine curve it has an amplitude and it has a wavelength when we are awake we are in this state which we call as the beta state where we are very much conscious of our surroundings we are talking we are taking in information when we start to relax a bit from the beta state we go into the alpha state where the up and down of that sine curve becomes a little more flatter so we start to relax from beta state we slip then into the theta state and then that's how theta healing is another modality which utilizes this hypnotic trance for healing work and then finally when you fall asleep that becomes the delta state so anywhere between the beta which is the awake state and the delta which is the sleeping state the meditative trance like state in between is called the state of hypnosis very natural it happens to us every day at least twice a day uh, we are in trance when we are watching tv when you are binging on netflix when you are reading a book when you are listening to music at any time when your body becomes very relaxed and your mind becomes very alert you are slipping into a hypnotic trance and that brings me to the next um topic that i want to first that you understand hypnosis now now comes the fun part of what hypnosis is not and that is where you know as a practicing therapist these are the questions that i answer every single day almost to new clients let's look at that myth number 1 is i am going to be helpless under hypnosis and this comes with a fear of loss of control that you know oh i'm going to fall asleep and the therapist the hypnotherapist is going to control me that doesn't happen that doesn't work uh, you are not helpless under hypnosis under the state of hypnosis 
we have access into the subconscious mind but a part of your conscious mind is still awake it is not acting it is not interrupting in the session but you are completely aware of your surroundings you can hear what is happening outside and god forbid if there is a discomfort or there is for example the say you are in the middle of a session and the fire alarm rings there is a way to count you up and we go out and we can stop the session it doesn't mean you get um, stuck into limbo uh, you cannot move your body none of that happens there is no state of helplessness um, sessions are done with full consent of uh, the client the client is aware and we only work to a contract we just don't work to let's just hypnotize and work on anything and everything it's a very structured process and therapist and client are in a conversation in that hypnotic trance so there is constant flow of information from both sides and hence there is no sense of helplessness or overt control from the therapist a uh, myth number 2 is uh, not everybody can be hypnotized anyone and everyone can be hypnotized should they wish to be hypnotized so when we work with clients these are people who are coming with um, real life issues of you know either uh, anxiety or depression or uh, physical health issues relationship issues fears phobias um uh, when i say physical issues it could be diseases it could be weight management it could be pains and aches um it could be anything under the sun now when people come with their agenda and they have they give the full consent to the therapist to work with them then everyone can be hypnotized however not everybody is hypnotized in the same way and that is because we are different in our personalities we are different in the way we take in information uh, there are uh, sometimes we use questionnaires we use uh, cognitive work to first ascertain what is your way of taking in information and sharing information once we have the clarity on that then it becomes very easy to use the right induction technique which will help you or any other client to go very very easily and successfully into the state of hypnosis um point number 3 hypnosis is same as sleeping no it is not hypnosis is a trance like state so as i explained hypnosis happens when your brain waves are in either theta or in alpha and sleeping happens when we are in the delta state so it is a myth that you will come and you will lie down on the couch and therapist will put you to sleep and then um, some magic will happen and then you will heal it doesn't work like that uh, the magic is because we are working on the part of the mind that we call as the subconscious mind and i'll be talking about it a little later that's the only magical part the magical part is the the rate at which healing happens under hypnosis or this modality but it is not you don't sleep in a session you are very much um, awake and for any reason if you doze off then as a therapist we are going to wake you up because we need your conscious mind presence as well when we are doing the session number 4 hypnosis makes you reveal deep dark secrets against your will i ask i get asked this question all the time that is again not true and none of us as therapists have any intentions to you know dig deep into or have that curiosity into your Uh, into aspects of your life that you don't wish to share um we work with a contract so if say client comes with a complaint of uh, say uh, fear or a phobia our therapies are only bound by that contract and under hypnosis you will only share what you are comfortable sharing it is not a practice of mind control it is not sometimes you know in movies or uh, Uh, when we hear about you know uh, stage hypnosis that is different that is what we call as hypnotism um, that is done for the purpose of uh, entertainment what you see on stage hypnosis then that is completely different from what we do in the therapy therapeutic work in therapeutic work we are actually addressing um, issues that are not letting somebody live their life to the fullest so yes there is no revealing of secrets like people ask sometimes you know would you know my secrets my bank account details or things that i don't want to share not at all uh, we have no intentions of going there we just go where where you are working on where client wants to heal that is the zone we work in 
hypnotherapy is like magic it's a mystical practice no it's not um, the rate at which people heal is actually what i call as uh, magical but it is not magic it is a pure science it is a science uh, that can be learned it is an art that can be bettered with practice and that brings me to the last point that hypnotherapists have special powers no we don't as i said i come from a completely different background i come from a complete corporate background and now into the world of mental health and trust me i have no special power and none of the hypnotherapists have any special powers our special power is what we study it's a science when you study it when you understand it when you apply it you work it is just like um, studying any other field of work it doesn't require any speciality it only requires if you if you feel this is the line of work that will give you joy um that is your passion um the, you know working with people is something that you enjoy then those are your special powers but you need not be gifted you need not have a very strong intuition none of that is required it is a science that can be actually you can come to class you can study it and you can practice now i'm going to take a small pause i'm going to check the chat box and if there are any other myths any other questions that you have in mind that you have heard about hypnotherapy and you want to get clarified um you can either unmute yourself or you can um, type it in the chat box these are my top uh, myths which i kind of you know get questioned and uh, uh people ask me all the time when i tell them i'm a therapist or when when i have clients uh, coming to work with me so if you have questions please add it to the chat box i will move on uh so if if this is not what it is then let's understand what is hypnosis and what is this whole domain of mind sciences now that brings us to a question a very simple question that what is mind i want you guys to give it a thought take a minute and either unmute yourself and talk to me and tell me what do you think is mind where is your mind or you can add it in your chat box as well let's just see between the eight nine of us that we are here what are our thoughts about mind because if we are not clear on that then we can't proceed to understanding the science of the mind it's a very very simple question now let's see how we define it so i'm just going to wait for your answers don't think too much um, just shoot what you think is the answer to the question what is mind i'm i'm sure you we all agree that we all have a mind that we operate out of something some intelligence so my question is what is mind and where is your mind okay madhuri says uh, mind is collective trauma of our ancestors and ours pratika something that allows us to think yes of course both both of you are um, right it's a partial definition of what you're giving but yes i cannot refute uh, anything that both of you said anybody else anyone else has any thoughts uh, where is your mind where is it located and the more you think the more vague it gets right we are even struggling to define what mind is uh grosia yes uh, mind is our best friend and our worst enemy okay um, yeah and i agree i agree if you if we are able to use our mind properly then it is the best tool on earth but the question is is your mind controlling you or you are controlling your mind shadi mind to me is a part of my existence and being that controls everything manifests the future and judging the past and the present yeah perfect oh, i'm i'm very very glad that you all are sharing this now tell me where is your mind now if i ask you where is your heart you can tell me in your body where your heart is beating because it's very easy to feel the heart beat if i ask you where is your stomach you can tell me where is your stomach located and if i ask you where is your mind then think and tell me where do you think is your mind Yeah. <laughs> 
there's a long silence okay so uh, okay maybe it's the brain but i think it's all over the body says darren maybe works with brain but i feel it is out of my body thank you so much yes you're right so brain is not the mind okay uh, brain is an organ inside our body so that is going to be very separate from our definition of mind if you look even if you google and if you look at the oxford dictionary for the definition of mind even the oxford dictionary has a very weird definition it says mind is the element of a person that enables them to be aware of the world and their experiences to think to feel the faculty of consciousness and thought now what is important in this definition is you get a sense that it is an element of a person it is a not a body part and b because it's not a body part it is an intangible asset it discovers of almost what all of you said it's where how we think it's how we have the collective information of our ancestors um it is where we have the faculty of our consciousness all that is fine to come down to a very basic understanding let's just understand the uh, the the differences and the connection between the brain and the mind so just like i i have i'm connecting to you today through my laptop now every time i have to change the slide or i have to adjust and look at the comments in your box what am i doing every time i am operating and i'm only touching the hardware of my laptop however i'm using something very intangible at the same time say for example the software of zoom or the software of microsoft powerpoint but the fun part is even when i have to operate that software my only access is through the hardware which is the body of the computer of my laptop similarly the difference between brain and mind is brain is part of the hardware it is a tangible organ in our bodies when something goes wrong with the brain we go to a psychiatrist we go to a doctor who can work on this organ of brain which is inside our skull can give medication and we can heal it but sometimes the issues in our lives are not related to our brain so for example if there if there's a person who is uh, has this tremendous fear of heights this is nothing wrong with the hardware or with the functioning of his or her brain which brings us to this other part of our existence somebody said it's a part of my being it's the part of my existence 100% correct that is what we call the mind mind imagine is the software that is now working on the hardware of my body on the brain and then that is how i am experiencing my life it is a tool it is an instrument and the better we understand this in instrument the better we are able to then make and use that instrument to our advantage if you look at the um, the holistic definition of mind in holistic sciences we define mind as a vibrating ball of energy all around us somebody mentioned this in the comment right it is inside me it is outside of me it is both actually so imagine mind to be a vibrating ball of energy all around us the center of which is at the pit of your stomach now here is the fun part if i ask you if you scan your physical body tell me at the pit of your stomach what organ will you find and if you go into human and anatomy what you will find at the pit of our bellies is our small intestine in other words our gut and this is where the phrase i have a gut feeling comes from technically speaking your gut and my gut has no thinking capacity it is part of my gastrointestinal tract and the only a function of my gut is to digest the food that i eat and yet we use this phrase very very often saying i have a gut feeling that gut feeling that point in our bodies inside at the at the pit of our bellies is what we call as the epicenter of the mind the center of the mind and hence just not the term gut feeling many times we feel a lot of emotions also in that area so you know when children say i have a butterflies in my stomach or even for us like we feel that nervousness that butterflies now if you cut open the stomach there are no butterflies there no there's no larva there's no pupa 
but what you are feeling those sensations is at that center of the mind so it is a software it is an intangible asset we cannot unlike the brain and the physical body we cannot touch or feel the mind we can only experience it now if you go deeper into it if this is the mind if this is that vibrating ball of energy all around us through which we are experiencing life i'm pretty sure both all of you will agree that we have say roughly i'm i'm giving you a very very um um what do you say a sneak peek into the science of the mind when i teach the course this in itself is almost half a day of um, understanding our conscious and our subconscious mind and in depth but just to give you a very sneak peek a brief idea um if this is the mind we have two parts there is one conscious and there is one subconscious look at this like an iceberg when you look at an iceberg in the ocean we are only able to see 1/10 of it and the 9/10 of that iceberg is actually submerged in water the same thing is for our minds only roughly 1/10 10% of the mind is what we call as the conscious mind which means there is a bigger part which is submerged which is below our level of consciousness and that's what we call as the subconscious mind now what does this conscious and the subconscious do what are we doing now we are very conscious and we are very consciously now using our thought process we are thinking we are using the logic we are analyzing we are feeling we are deciding we are judging all these functions are actually coming from our conscious mind so just imagine we are roughly using only 10% of our mind's capability and we are living our lives with it imagine if we could just you know scratch into the surface of what lies beneath the power of the subconscious how our lives would be very very different now if everything is happening here at a very conscious level thinking logic analysis feelings then of course my question is then what does the subconscious mind do why do we even have a subconscious mind and why do we have such a big space why is it 1/10th and then 9/10th uh, now the subconscious mind functioning is very very simplistic it doesn't do so many things like how uh, all other dysfunctions uh, of logic thinking analysis is happening it doesn't so what happens here is very very simple yet very very strong the first function of subconscious mind is to keep us alive what does that mean if i tell you guys switch on your, your cameras and then use your right hand and wave at me you can very easily do this action of waving at me and that is precisely because you are consciously listening to me the voluntary movements of your body are governed by the conscious mind so it's very easy for us to raise our hand and wave at each other now at the same time if i say that oh great you have great control over your body you just waved at me so then now just stop the functioning of your liver for the next 5 seconds would any of you be able to do it the answer is no none of us would do it you would laugh at me if i if i even suggest that and why and that is precisely because the involuntary movements in our bodies the internal organ function the functioning of the organs that actually keep us alive is governed by the subconscious mind it is almost like an autopilot say for example when you go to sleep at night you are not telling your heart keep beating till i wake up in the morning lungs don't forget to breathe because i'm going to sleep we just sleep very peacefully we wake up in the morning as if yeah nothing's happened but what has happened in between is that your entire body function is being worked to a, like it's like a clockwork that is working and that is only governed by the subconscious mind hence many times you will hear of cases where people slip into coma and then after months or weeks they wake up and they are able to relate completely what has happened during the comatose phase what the doctor was saying what the family members were doing and don't we laugh about it and say oh wow how 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 incredible is this how amazing is this but what is actually incredible and amazing is the power of the subconscious mind because the subconscious is still awake when even when the client uh, when the patient is in a comatose phase 
subconscious mind when it dies is when we die which means our internal body functions our organs stop working so it keeps us alive first and foremost subconscious mind never sleeps and the second function of the subconscious mind is storage so imagine your conscious mind to be like the cpu of your computer you know the central processing unit where you are constantly taking in information from all sides and on the other hand your subconscious mind is like the hard drive of your computer and what do you do with your hard drive you simply store your files so all your experiences from the time that you were born till now imagine every moment of your life has been stored as a file as an archive in your subconscious mind some of it you can recollect and some of it you can't subconscious mind has only these two functions there is no third function and it is very simplistic there is no sense of judgment so when it stores these files it has no understanding of whether it is storing what is it storing and how much is it storing but no judgment for how is it a good file or a bad file a good experience or a bad experience shadi has a question i just want to know how uh, we know this percentage how has this been calculated okay shadi this entire model that i'm presenting to you comes from uh, the professional hypnotism manual by dr john capus uh, if you need more information i will of course leave my number and my details uh, after the webinar you can get in touch with me and this is his research work and on that note let me tell you when we work with a model there is never a 100% answer to is it perfectly 10% and 90% if you ask me shadi many many schools of thought actually believe that the conscious mind is less than 5% and the subconscious is way more than 90% different schools have different thoughts it is dependent on the research work that has been conducted by them um however when this model is actually applied to therapeutic purposes it it has proven to be to be correct if you need more information i will be more than happy to to share the details of of the research you will be coming in my course great then you will have all the information then i will see you on saturday for sure <laughs> great okay so coming back to um the functions of the conscious and the subconscious now moving on let's see what is coming next ha the, the, now just not in terms of the space now more fun element comes in now if the strength of our conscious mind is 1 times x the strength of the subconscious mind is anywhere between 6000 to 35000 times x so just not the size but the strength of the mind is also very 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 different and this is where the answer to many other questions lie question number 1 you know when i say when i work as a therapist um, nobody comes to therapy saying that my life is great like you know i'm so beautiful that i want to change it or i'm so rich that i want to lose money or i have beautiful relationships in my life and i want to change that no right people come when they are in pain when they feel stuck when their desires of the conscious mind and the reality doesn't match so we come to therapy and we say you know i have tried keto and intermittent fasting and all sorts of diet and i cannot lose my weight and i don't know what's happening or i want a stable job but every time i step into a job something happens and um, I, i i just can't sustain it i want a loving partner in my life but all the people i'm attracting are of the similar pattern or it just not working this is a typical case where my conscious mind wants money relationship job etc but there is something hidden below below the level of my consciousness that doesn't allow me to have it and this is where hypnotherapy comes into play uh before i go into the details of how the therapy part works um someone mentioned in the definition that it is a repertoire of our ancestral memories this is true if you look at subconscious mind more deeply subconscious mind can also be broken down further into two parts 
One is what we call the modern memory, and that is my memory. So in my mind, Arpita's modern memory will be Arpita's experiences of this lifetime. So from the time that I am born till now, all my memories will be stored in this part of the mind, what we call as the modern memory. But there is also something that we carry genetically, ancestrally from our lineage. And that is what we call as evolutionary memory or primitive memory. So this could be um, anything that is passed on to us through our genes. Um, if you believe in past lives, this is where people talk about past life therapy. If you don't believe in past life, we just keep it from therapeutic purpose. It doesn't make any difference. Um, we call it ancestral memory or evolutionary memory, something that is not you. So you haven't experienced it. Say, for example, if I say that my nose is exactly like my great grandmother, which is fair enough for me to understand, because guess what? There is genes. So my physical features can be like my mom, my grandma or my great grandmother. But if I say that my I have anxiety and I experience anxiety in the same way that my grandfather did, then we start to question it. But it is exactly the same way that the physical features can resemble our ancestors and our family members in a similar way. Diseases, conditions can also be percolated down from one generation into the other. And that part is what we store in our primitive memory of our subconscious mind. Yes, it is very intriguing therein, and um, that is how it is percolated. So uh, the definition somebody said about uh, ancestors, this is where it comes from. So we just are not who we are on our experiences in life. We are also carrying in us many, many, many generations and their good experiences, their not so good experiences, etc. Now, taking it one step further, this primitive memory that we have is where we also store our most basic instinct, fight or flight. So now understand this from the perspective of mental health. When there is a trigger in, the, in, in our environment, say example, I, I'll give a very common example, COVID. We have been dealing with this for the last two years ongoing. So COVID is something that is external. COVID happens. Now we try to process it first through our conscious mind and we do what we have to do, but this also has an impact on our subconscious. And imagine when we go through times of isolation, of fear, of not understanding what is happening, all of these, these thoughts, these emotions start, imagine they start to trigger files that are embedded in our subconscious mind. In the screen, how you see these red files, Imagine one or two of them are corrupted files. So today when I feel the fear of COVID or the repercussions of it, it is just not my fear today. Now my mind, my 6,000 times strong subconscious mind wakes up and files from there also start to shake. And to make it even worse, now I'm even able to access the same theme of thoughts that probably my ancestors had or anybody in my family life. And then my mind decides either to fight or run. When we feel the fight syndrome, in many cases, that's when we experience nervousness, anxiety, restlessness. And many times when we take the flight syndrome, that's when we withdraw. We become silent, we become sad, and we withdraw. And again, this is a function of how we are interpreting the information that is coming from our environment. One last bit, there is just not these two parts. There is a third part of the mind, what we call as the critical filter or the critical mind. In very simple words, these are our belief systems. These are our conditioning. In the first eight years of our life, so imagine if this mind is a software, this mind gets programmed for each one of us in the first eight years of our life. Hence, in any culture, any religion, any part of the world, people will say, be very careful how you speak to children because children don't have a filter. If you tell a child you're beautiful, he or she grows up and believes they are beautiful. If you tell a child you're stupid, they don't understand the word stupid, but they grow up believing they are stupid. Words have powers. 
especially in the first eight years of our lives. This is the time and the development of the belief systems, our inherent very, very core beliefs that we have about ourselves start at this age. And by the age of eight, it is finalized. It is kind of concretized. And I know it sounds very morbid because right now none of us here are eight years old. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't change our belief systems. And I'm coming to that because hypnotherapy is one of the modalities which you can use very effectively to let go of redundant old belief systems that don't serve you. How are these belief systems affected and how are they developed in the first eight years? Dependent on four factors, as you see on the screen, the seer, the socio, which is the family, the society in which we grew up, E for economic, the financial um, uh, setup in which we have grown up, rich, poor, whatever struggles, E again for um, education that we have received or not received, and R for religious beliefs. So socio-economic education and religious factors that affect us during the first eight years of our life actually develop those belief systems in us. Now, if we are, so imagine your software was developed in the first eight years and for the rest of our lives, we are just repeating that. We are just utilizing that software and we are uh, just churning it out. So the programming happens in the first eight years and for the rest of our lives, we are just working on those premises. Hypnotherapy is one of the mind science modalities that breaks through this critical filter. And it, we go to the core of sometimes, like for example, when I say that client comes and says, you know, that um, I don't know, I just, just don't seem to find the right person in my life. And um, I'm, uh, I meet the same kind of people, same kind of experiences. And it's almost that I don't um, deserve love. This statement in itself is a belief system that I'm not worthy of love or I don't deserve love. Um, I'm not good enough. And these belief systems can be extremely conscious to somebody. And at the same time, for some people, it can be a complete like shocker when it comes out in the session that, wow, I never knew I felt so, um, uh, let's just say, um, not, not so great about myself. Like I had self-worth issues or I don't have good self-esteem. These belief systems actually in later life will only make us attract those people, those events, those situations that keep perpetuating the same belief system. Hypnotherapy is a science in which we work on all of this. We work on the conscious mind. There is a cognitive part to it. We work on the experiences, on the files that are stored in our subconscious. We work even on the belief systems as well. Um, there is some comment on the chat. Oh, Madhuri, you, thank you so much. Yes, I'm trying to simplify it because uh, that's the whole purpose. You know, the, this is not rocket science. This is not that you have to be intellectually uh, stimulated to a certain extent or very intelligent to understand this. Not at all. This is so basic. And uh, if you ask me, Madhuri, I would, I would wish that in my lifetime, this becomes a subject in schools and wellness and mental health and mind sciences are taught right from primary school. We shouldn't be allowed to graduate before we know the basics of you know, how, to, how we think, how we manage our emotions. And um, we should not be uh, allowed to date, to get married, to have children, to work. All of this should happen only later, uh, only once we have grasped how the mind works. Uh, Kritika, can hypnotherapy help to heal primitive memory too? Yes, 100%. It can help to heal primitive memory too. So as I said, the entire domain of past life therapy is based on primitive memory healing. Um, it also heals ancestral memory. So if there is a trend that has come down your family line, then yes, with hypnosis, 100% you can heal. You know, for example, when we, be, when we deal with fears and phobias, there's a difference, like fears come from our modern memory, most of the time, our own experiences in life. However, unexplained fear, like phobia, like I've never been, uh, I've nothing bad has ever happened to me when I went to a swimming pool, but I'm scared of water. Phobias mostly come from primitive memory, from our ancestors, past lives, whatever you would wish to believe in. But yes, 100%, it can be healed. 
what is the difference between hypnotherapy and theta healing? Shadi, I have not studied theta healing. So I can only give you a very brief idea. Uh, the similarity is that we, I think both modalities work on the theta state, on the state of hypnosis. But please don't, uh, I'm not the right person to ask about theta healing from what I understand from many of my clients who have done theta healing before and they come to hypnotherapy. I think, um, how do I explain this? I, I think they have a concept of, again, it's, it's similar in a way that there are belief systems, there are memories that they work on, but I think they, they connect the creator or there's a, the modality is different. Um, I can talk about hypnotherapy. Let me not talk about theta. Either I'm going to give you wrong information or I'm going to confuse you. So what you can do is we have theta healers in illuminations. If you are interested, you can contact them and do a like a free consultation and then you can figure out what theta healers do. Would hypnotherapy increase the conscious mind percentage? No, Darren, the percentage remains the same. What happens is in hypnotherapy, imagine one of the files is corrupted in that subconscious space that you see here. What will happen with therapy is that file will move from your unconscious subconscious space into your space of awareness. So again, giving a uh, metaphorical example, if the file is in my um, uh, D drive, I'm going to take that file, the corrupted file out of my computer D drive, and I'm going to put it on my desktop. So in a way, if you mean that uh, the percentage increases, no, but your consciousness increases, your understanding, your awareness of the problem increases. And when you understand the problem a little better, then you are able to solve it faster and quicker. But the percentage doesn't change. It still remains the same. So what does this mean? What does then hypnotherapy means? With this background of the theory of the mind, what it means is we mind is a tool. We are going to understand how the tool works and we are going to reprogram it. We are going to rewire it. And how do we do that? We do that. We don't, it's not like Harry Potter when you pull out memories. No, we do not delete memories. We do not say, oh no, that bad thing never happened. The abuse never happened. You know, the dog bite never happened. None of that. The experiences still stay with you. So we don't erase the experiences. We don't say it never happened, but we neutralize it. What does it mean to neutralize an experience? Imagine you have a file, like in the previous slide, you saw the files. What do the files contain? The files contain two things. The files contain one, a fact. And the fact is, oh, I was bitten by a dog when I was three years old. The file also contains my emotional charge related to that experience, that I was scared and I cried and it was painful. And then I had to take injections when we are working on a client, for example, has been bitten by a dog and has fear of dogs and pets, we are not going to erase the experience of something bad that has happened. That's part of the story. What we work on is that emotional charge. So from say a negative minus 100, we bring it back to zero. What does that mean? That means that today, when I see a dog, I know it is a dog and I will not react in the same way that I used to react before. So my palms will not sweat, I will not hyperventilate or I will not you know, run away from that space. Healing means I deal with those stored emotions that I could not process earlier, but with the help of hypnotherapy, we release those pent up emotions. So today when I face a dog, I just face a dog and if there is no interaction with the dog, there is no interaction with the dog, but I don't go into my state of panic or palpitations. So imagine neutralizing um, the, the charges, the negative charges, the negative emotions that are stored in our subconscious mind. We pick up the file and we release those charges. What does that mean? It means we are separating client from that experience. You're not fused together. You are who you are and you had an experience with the dog, but that is not going to define you for the rest of your life. And when you're able to detach that through the trance, in the trance, through the hypnotherapy uh, tools and techniques, we are able to release that toxic emotion that got stuck in that event. So the goal, the ultimate goal of hypnotherapy is to reprogram our thoughts, our beliefs by healing out 
whatever is stored in my subconscious in your subconscious that is standing against my conscious desires in a very simple way we all deserve happiness and we happiness is kind of birthright for all of us so anything that stands between me and my happiness me and that ideal life the perfect life that i want and if that comes from a block or a pattern that is in our subconscious space hypnotherapy is a beautiful tool to use and let that go question normally how long does a hypnotherapy session last Kritika, it can last ideally anywhere between an hour to 90 minutes. Um, that's what I do, not more than that. I'm sure the number of sessions needed varies from person to person and depending on the problem, but just want to have an idea. And do you offer individual hypnotherapy sessions at illuminations apart from training? Yes, you're right. It depends on A, the person and B, it depends on the uh, issue that we are working with. Uh, to answer your other question first, yes, I, I do practice. I exclusively, uh, you said um, you have come to illuminations, right? So yes, I do practice at illuminations as a therapist as well. Um, now, the number of sessions varies depending on what we are working. For example, if it is a fear or if it's a fear client, then just a couple of sessions are good enough to let go of that inherent fear. If it is a phobia client, then we are looking at more deeper primitive memory issues. It could take anywhere between five to seven sessions. If we are doing relationship counseling, again, between five to seven sessions. Uh, if we are doing addictions, these are the ones that take a little longer. Uh, also, sometimes to do with the body because the body takes a little bit of time to readjust. Anywhere between, uh, in my private practice, between a single session to five, six sessions is max. It doesn't go beyond that. So I'm not a fan of uh, propagating, uh, buying big packages because, you know, sometimes healing happens really, really fast. Just a couple of sessions are good enough to get you on track and then a couple of more get you going. Having said that, it is individual and only when I do the session with the clients or I do the, a free consultation with them, I'm in a better position to give them an idea of how long it may take. Hope that answers your question. If not, then you ask again and I will rephrase. So with this understanding, okay, wait, somebody has another question. Shadi, uh, regression is recommended for everyone. I mean, you think we all have the ability to deal with memories of the past, the mind chooses to forget. Um, regression is a specialized branch inside of hypnotherapy, Shadi. And you know, the beauty of it is that if you are ready for it, your mind will go there. Now, remember, what is the function of subconscious mind? It is to keep you alive, survival. So if you're not ready to open that Pandora's box yet, your mind will never take you to that point. So when you are doing hypnotherapy, when you're doing a regression therapy, if you hit a memory that you now remember, you're talking of repressed memories here, when you say the mind chooses to forget, this is very common in therapy. In the therapeutic, in that one hour, hour and a half, sometimes client comes across repressed memories. And yes, at that time, they are able to deal with it. They were repressed because previous to this time, maybe they did not have the tools, techniques, they were not mature or they were not ready. But when you hit a memory, I have never come across a single client who has come across a memory and has not been able to work through it. So either you will not come across those memories if you're not yet ready to digest them. But if you do come across one in your regression sessions and the session is done with utmost care and concern, there is no, no worries there at all. Uh, we do have the ability to deal with it. Whatever you are ready for, only that much subconscious will open to you. It will never open something that you're not ready to deal with. So coming back to our understanding, now you understand the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, you understand the states. So this is what I was saying in, um, in the beginning, that when we are awake, the, both our conscious mind and our subconscious mind are totally awake and in control. When you go to sleep at night, conscious mind has no control. We are sleeping. But your subconscious, if you look at the slide, the subconscious mind is always awake and always in control. That is because 
if it is not awake and if it is not in control, we do not survive. Our internal body functions are totally governed by the subconscious mind. The difference between the sleep state and the hypnosis state, you see in the hypnotic trance, the conscious mind is still awake. You're still present, but the only difference is you have no control. So the conscious mind does not interfere. The responses to the questions that the therapist is asking actually comes from the very, very deep space of the subconscious mind. Why would you choose this modality? For me, it's very simple. To me, it's a life skill. It is as good as knowing how to swim, knowing how to ride a bike. I think each and every person on earth should have the basic skill of understanding how the mind and hypnosis works. It completely, it is so powerful. It makes you so empowered that I can, I can talk for two hours on that. Second, it's a very safe modality. Nothing can go wrong. And that is again related to Shadi's question that because subconscious mind will never open up something that you cannot deal with. So contrary to most uh, popular belief that this is mumbo jumbo and what will open up, none of that. It's actually the safest thing on earth because subconscious mind is the custodian of your safety and we are working with the subconscious mind. And third reason, super effective. If you look at the um, slide and the, the details uh, on the slide here, um, if you see the efficiency of this modality after six sessions compared to other modalities. Now, this is not to say the other modalities are not good. Huh? Every modality has its own audience and every modality works beautifully with certain set of people. The only beauty and why I chose personally also hypnotherapy is because to me, it's like an 80-20 principle. You focus where it matters the most. So if the dramas of my life, if the experiences of my life, the belief, embedded belief system, my repressed memories are playing so much havoc in my life, I might as well look into the depth of my subconscious mind. That is the only, only difference. Otherwise, we are very much um, we are respectful of all modalities. Uh, of course, uh, each modality works in a different way for different people. Who can be a hypnotherapist? I touched upon it earlier. Anyone. You do not need to have any specific qualifications to be a therapist, to be a hypnotherapist. Um, uh, in my, as I said, I come from the corporate world. I, I am a practicing hypnotherapist and I teach hypnotherapy. In my class, there are doctors, nurses, um, various people from the medical field. There are healers, there are other therapists, there are homemakers, there are uh, school teachers. Um, there are uh, people again from the corporate world, lawyers, uh, um, people from the media industry, everybody and anybody. I never have a repeat in my class. Somebody is always there who comes from a different profession. Um, the only thing you need is if this fascinates you, if working with people, helping people is something you want to do, if that's like your calling, your passion, and you have the zest to learn. That's all that you need to be a hypnotherapist. Question. Would you be able to assess a person's mental health through hypnosis, like bipolar or depression stages? Uh, Madhuri, I would do that before I do the session with hypnotherapy. So if there are, uh, and a very good question, because things like sometimes depression and even bipolar, these are diseases of the brain. You know, there's a malfunction in the brain. So in those cases, it is only best if you do not have a medical background to refer these cases initially to a medical practitioner, to a psychiatrist. Um, you could work with patients like, for example, I do work with uh, depression patients, but many a times they are already on medication. Uh, I am in touch with the psychiatrist and I know their dosage. They never they are not allowed to go off and we never say that they have to go off their medication. You could work, but if you're starting, if you're new to this profession and you do not have a medical background, then I when you identify or people come across and you have knowledge that they have any of these, then that's where we refer them to a psychiatrist. Um, I would not uh, diagnose it with hypnosis. I would not do hypnosis to this person in the first place. Through the cognitive case receiving, it is, it is possible to diagnose. 
in the level two of the course that I teach, we do teach uh, depression. So you are able to diagnose a person with depression, whether they have minor depression, major depression, um, the signs and what do you do and how do you work through depression? Um, to answer your question in a very short way, um, hypnosis is not the first session that we do with clients who are depressed. There are other ways to work first and later hypnosis will come into play. Now, for the, this is for interested people who want to do the course. Where can you study? You can look at the website. I'm mindful we are a little uh, over time. Uh, you could go to the website. Eka is the parent company. I'm a teacher with Eka. If you're in the UAE, you could study this in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi. We do these webinars, uh, foundation courses. Once you become uh, a, a student, you will be having access to our support groups, which one of our teachers will conduct on a monthly basis. Uh, how does the course go? This comes from ECA. Um, ECA is an ISO standardized and certified institute working all around the world. So just go to their website, www.eka.co.in. Uh, through the course, of course, um, you are guided through by each level by your teachers who also are your mentors. Uh, we are looking at an integrated approach, which means in this course, we blend in um, the Western clinical hypnotherapy with the Eastern philosophies of the metaphysical world as well. So by the end of level five, you have a mix of both. Uh, this is how the course goes. You have two days of level one, five days of level two and three, six days of level four, and then eight days of level five. After each level, you will do case studies. You work very closely with your teachers. At the end of level five, you do a multiple choice um, test, written test. Uh, you submit your case studies, you get evaluated on it, and then you get a final certification. You get certifications at every level, and then after your full completion of the course, you get a final certificate as well. Who certifies you? Of course, ECA certifies you. In the UAE, this course is recognized by the KHDA and your final certificate can also be certified by the KHDA. It is completely legal to practice here. Um, what affiliations do you have from this course? After you complete this course, you could become a member of IMDHA, International uh, Medical and Dental Health uh, and Hypnotherapy Association. TASO School of Netherlands also certifies it. You can go to IPHM. There are so many other bodies that you can apply to and get their certifications once you cover, uh, once, once you complete the ECA certification. Uh, Shadi said, you're coming to class. When can you start? You can start now um, if this interests you. As I said, many people do this course to become therapists and many people just do this course for their own uh, understanding of life. So whichever spectrum you are on, you're more than welcome. To join me on my uh, on on my courses on the trainings and um, that's about it that's all i had for you if you have any questions please shoot i will leave my number my details here on the slide you can always get in touch if you have questions later okay thank you madhuri thank you darren I am I'm very happy that you liked the session. The sole purpose is to, you know, share the knowledge and um, to bring to, to everyone what hypnotherapy actually means. So my pleasure completely. I will be here around. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Pratika. <laughs> I think if you want, uh, Illuminations will send you the, the session is recorded. So you can also have a copy of it. You can message me uh, directly. I can send you the copy as well. Have fun. I will be around here for a few more minutes. And any questions, any queries, any comments, I'm here. Otherwise, uh, Ramadan Karim and have a great evening, all of you. Yes, Shadi, question, shoot. Hi, Darren, you have to leave. Uh, most welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you liked the session. Yes, Shadi, the software can affect the hardware. This is exactly what happens. You know, first, it all begins probably at the level of the software. 
So the pathology starts there, uh, the stored up emotions, the repressed emotions, it finally percolates down to the hardware. So it starts to just give you an example. It all starts with our thoughts. Level one is thoughts. Thoughts create emotions. It comes down and percolates down to the level of emotions. From emotions, it percolates down to the level of energy, which is also we call the chakras or our aura. And then finally, from the chakras and from the aura, it percolates down to the physical body. So what is happening in the software actually then translates as a disease into the body, which is the hardware. And of course, when there is discomfort in the body, that also impacts the software. They're interconnected. This is what we call as the mind-body connection. It's never in isolation. It is always happening together. And uh, we can't separate them. We can understand them. We can have the awareness and we can use tools and techniques to heal at the level of the body and also at the level of the mind, both. I hope that answers your question, Shadi. Great. Good luck. Um, and I'll see you in class. And for the rest of you, uh, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Adi. Take care. Bye.